I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you. So good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Before I begin, I want to recognize and thank Harry Alford and the National Black Chamber of Commerce for joining us today from, the inter from energy and environment to healthcare and housing. Harry and his team are champions for policies that support and uplift underserved and minority communities. Thank you, Harry, for being here. Today we also have, yes, that we should applaud. Today we have the privilege of hearing from Harry, as well as Michelle Bloodworth, the president of the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, and Kirk Johnson, senior vice president for government relations of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Shortly after President Trump took office, he issued an executive order to promote American energy independence. He directed federal agencies to repeal and replace regulatory burdens that were stifling energy innovation and production. Today, we are once again delivering on President Trump's directive. We are gathered here to announce our proposal to revise under Clean Air Act Section 111B the previous administration's determination of the best system of emission reductions for new power plants. Our proposal will replace the Obama EPA's 2015 determination that carbon capture and sequestration technology was the best system of emission reduction for new plants. Their determination was disingenuous. They knew that the technology was not adequately demonstrated, which is what is required under the law. Our proposal will replace those onerous, untenable requirements with high yet achievable standards that are rooted in reality. We are proposing to determine that the best system of emission reduction is the most efficient demonstrated steam cycle in combination with best operating practices. To put it into clear and simple terms, we are rescinding unfair burdens on America's energy providers and leveling the playing field so that new energy technologies can be part of America's future. This proposal would further America's historic energy production under President Trump. It would help keep energy prices affordable and it would encourage new investments in energy technologies. Coal use has not yet peaked worldwide. It continues to expand, particularly in Asia. The previous administration tried to take the U.S. coal industry out of the energy mix, which means that we would be no longer developing clean coal technologies here in the United States. Our proposal will encourage new investments in cleaner coal technologies. And by encouraging clean coal here in the U.S., we will be encouraging it worldwide. We will exp export our new technologies so that other nations can benefit from cleaner energy and reduce their CO2 emissions. You will see a decrease in emissions worldwide because of an increase in U.S. investments in new energy technologies. Although some are not reported this way, today's proposal is important to a cleaner, safer, and stronger future, more important than dialogue or unfulfilled commitments. This administration cares about actions and results, not talk and wishful thinking. And our actions and results speak for themselves. The U.S. is a global leader in clean energy progress. From 2005 to 2017, total U.S.-related CO2 emissions fell by 14 percent. In contrast, global energy-related CO2 emissions increased over 20 percent. In October, we released a new report which found that greenhouse gas emissions from major industrial sources decreased by 2.7 percent during President Trump's first year in office from 2016 to 2017. And we project that our 111B proposal will not result in any significant CO2 emission changes or costs. While many around the world are talking about reducing greenhouse gases, the U.S. continues to deliver. These achievements flow largely from breakthroughs in the private sector, not the heavy hand of government. The Trump administration has proven that burdensome federal regulations are not necessary to drive environmental progress. By allowing the genius of the private sector to work, we can keep American energy affordable, reliable, and abundant. Affordable energy benefits low and middle income Americans the most, particularly disadvantaged and underserved communities. That's why today's announcement and the President's regulatory reform agenda 
is so important to providing opportunity and prosperity to the Americans who need it the most. Thank you for your time, and now please join me in welcoming Harry Alford, the President and CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for being here. Such a warm welcome by the press, I've never had that before. <laughs> the last administration's war on coal was poised to increase energy costs, having negative impacts on low-income groups and minorities, including individuals, families, and minority-owned businesses. In fact, the National Black Chamber of Commerce did a study on the impacts of the so-called Clean Power Plan and found that the rule alone would have increased black poverty by 23% and Hispanic poverty by 26%, resulted in cumulative job losses of seven million for blacks and nearly 12 million for Hispanics by the year 2035. Decreased Hispanic and black medium household income by $455 and $515 respectively by 2035. The study also found that in fact, that in the face of rising energy costs, low income groups and minorities will cut spending related to healthcare, housing, food, in fact, inability to pay energy bills is one of the leading causes of homelessness. These EPA regulations have a significant impact on individuals, businesses, and communities I represent through the NBCC. So I'm happy to be here today for this historical moment where we're looking at good policy, effective policy, and realistic policy. Thank you very much. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Michelle Bloodworth, as Acting Administrator Wheeler uh, said a minute ago, and I'm the CEO of America's Power, also known as ACE. Uh, we represent, uh, our members consist of utilities, uh, generators, uh, coal producers, the railroads, barge operators, uh, and all those involved in the supply chain of coal electricity. Uh, we do advocate on behalf of coal electricity and also the coal fleet. Uh, I'd like to offer a few brief remarks, and I'd first like to thank uh, Acting Administrator uh, Wheeler and also the entire EPA staff for allowing us to represent uh, our members today at this really uh, important event. Let me start out by saying why we think new source performance standards uh, are important. Uh, first, they're important because we believe the coal fleet uh, is important. Second, the coal fleet does provide fuel diversity, it provides affordable electricity, uh, and it also provides fuel security, certainly larger discussions taking place today. The coal fleet also helps to provide grid resilience uh, and reliability. And finally, the coal fleet serves as an insurance policy uh, when other fuels are not available. Unfortunately, 40% of the coal fleet has either retired or announced intentions to retire. And we and others believe that the retirement of the coal uh, generation does threaten the reliability and the resilience of the grid. And because of the attributes of the coal fleet, we feel like it makes sense to replace at least some of these retiring coal units with new high efficiency, low emissions coal plants. The 2015 new source performance standards uh, were based on technology that we felt like was promising uh, but should not be the basis for setting standards under Section 111B of the Clean Air Act because carbon capture and storage was neither adequately demonstrated or economically feasible, which created an unsurmountable barrier to building any type of new plants, uh, coal plants in the United States. And while we've not evaluated the details of uh, the proposal that we uh, are hearing about today, it does appear that this proposal would make it feasible for new coal plants to be a viable option in the future in the United States. EPA's mandate does not involve energy policy, but we are pleased that the EPA policies, including the one offered today, are consistent uh, with sensible energy policy. And this is important because EPA policy should not drive energy policy, uh, certainly has been a case in the past. 
EPA's proposal today will make it possible to build new coal plants to replace some of the retirements and consequently help make this nation's electricity portfolio healthy. healthy. Let me point out by closing that coal is expected to remain an important source of electricity. EIA points out that coal will provide at least one quarter of all the electricity for the next three decades. Since the United States will continue to rely on coal for a long time, it makes good sense to invest in power uh, that is more efficient and more uh, environmentally sustainable moving forward. And EPA's proposal can help the United States reach that goal. We certainly look forward to working with EPA as they set sensible performance standards for new coal plants. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kirk Johnson. I'm Senior Vice President of Government Relations at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. That's a mouthful. Uh, America's electric cooperatives uh, represent 900 consumer-owned, uh, not-for-profit electric utilities serving 42 million Americans uh, across 47 states. That's one in eight Americans that get their electricity from a not-for-profit electric cooperative. And we are delighted to be here to see this proposal being unveiled uh, because we think it's very important that uh, the rules of the road for what new plants need to be, be they coal or natural gas, reflect the state of technology as it is today. Technology that is commercial available, that is adequately demonstrated, and the previous regulation did not do that. That's why we opposed it, that's why we commented heavily on it, that's why we litigated on it, because we want to make sure that there are rules that reflect the true nature of where technology is today. Not only that, we're very interested in advancing technology for the future because we've always been future oriented. And so our members are engaged in research across a wide array of new technologies, including carbon capture and sequestration, carbon capture and utilization. We are partners uh, in the XPRIZE Foundation Carbon Capture Research Program. And one of our members, based in Electric Power Cooperative, is offering their facility at the Dry Fork Station in Wyoming as the integrated test center for that research. NRECA has also financially supported that research because we want to make sure that whatever trends are going on today, we all know that they will change. And when they do, we want to make sure we have available resources to meet whatever those next trends will be, to make sure we keep our options on the table, to continue to provide electricity for those 42 million American consumers. And by the way, uh, we also represent 93% uh, of the persistent, or I should say we serve, provide electricity to 93% of the persistent poverty counties in this country. We represent some of the poorest areas in this country, people who cannot afford to have significant increases in their electricity and energy bills. And that's part of being the nature of being consumer-owned utilities. Our job is to look out for those consumers who own their electric utility and make sure that we are prepared, not just for today's needs, but for the future. So, Acting Administrator Wheeler, thank you very much for having us here. We look forward to reading and commenting on the details of the proposal and making sure that this policy is sound, both from a technological and legal perspective. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Harry, Michelle, and Kirk. And if you'd like to join me behind the table while I sign this, I'm, we're signing the proposal today, so I want to make sure that people comment on it. Let us know what you think. Thank you. Cheers. 